Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I am Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. This is our 1,000th episode, kind of. It's really episode 999. Part two will be episode 1000. And if your podcatcher numbers episodes and you're like, wait, that is not right. I have more than a thousand episodes already. There are some straight up reruns in the archive that we didn't count because those are not new. And we also didn't count Saturday classics since the whole point of those is that they are not new. They are from the archive. But we did count updates that we did consider to be new episodes back when we did them. Uh, back in the archive as well. So we had a hard time trying to decide what to cover for our thousandth episode. We started out with things that happened a thousand years ago or happened in the year 1000 and nothing was really grabbing us. So back at the start of February, we put the question out to our listeners on social media. We got literally hundreds of responses, <laughs> maybe even a thousand total responses. There were a lot. Um, and a lot of them were just, uh, someone said something one time, but a few things came up over and over. And one of those repeat submissions was the Japanese tradition of folding a thousand origami cranes, or maybe the story of Sadako Sasaki, who died of leukemia after the bombing of Hiroshima. And her effort to fold a thousand cranes became part of a grassroots peace movement among Japanese children. Uh, and that was the one we decided to do from those repeat requests that we got. This is ultimately a hopeful story because a thousandth episode seems kind of like a little bit of a celebration and it did not seem right to have a complete downer. We did get some very, very tragic requests that we, we thought seemed a little, uh, too heavy. Today's episode number 999 though does start off with some horrific wartime details and we're going to be talking about a child with cancer. Um, but, Episode 1000 is a, is more optimistic in its tone. And just for the sake of clarity, uh, generally in Japanese, names are typically presented with the family name first and the given name second. Um, in English, they're often presented the other way around. So in these episodes, we've used that Western order of given name first, primarily because that's how they were presented in uh, the Japanese resources that I had that were either written in Japanese and translated into English or written by Japanese people in English. So although uh, Sadako Sasaki's story begins with the bombing of Hiroshima, we really need to go back a little bit farther than that to put that bombing in context, and that's to the Second Sino-Japanese War. This is generally marked as stretching from 1937 to 1945, and then in its later years, it became the Pacific Theater of World War II. The Second Sino-Japanese War started after years of Japanese incursions into Chinese territory and then into other parts of Southeast Asia. This included the horrific Nanjing Massacre, in which Japanese troops killed as many as 300,000 people, most of them civilians, and raped or sexually assaulted tens of thousands of women. Japan and Germany were allies, and after France fell to Germany in 1941, the Vichy government agreed to allow Japan to take control of the colonial territory of French Indochina. Today, that's Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. And in response to the Japanese occupation of French Indochina, and in the hope of checking its advance into other parts of Southeast Asia, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt froze all Japanese assets that were held in the United States. Other nations followed suit, and the United States ordered an embargo of steel and oil exports to Japan as well. These were major sanctions, and the goal here was to pressure Japan into backing out of French into China and stopping its imperial expansion into other countries. Instead, it really had the opposite effect. Japan continued its push, attempting to reach territory that could supply it with these resources and capital that it no longer had. These sanctions are also cited as one of the factors that led Japan to attack Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, a little more than four months later, on December 7th, 1941. Fast forward to 1945, at the end of World War II. The Allies accepted Germany's unconditional surrender on May 8th of that year, ending World War II in Europe. But the war with Japan continued. As we discussed in our episode on the USS Indianapolis, by the summer of 1945, most American troops believed they were preparing for a full-scale invasion of Japan itself. 
Meanwhile, Japan's navy was nearly destroyed, and the Allies had started firebombing major Japanese cities. It's estimated that more than 300,000 Japanese citizens were killed in firebombing attacks between January of 1944 and August of 1945. In Tokyo alone, more than 100,000 people died in a firebombing over March 9th and 10th, 1945. In addition to the deaths, these incendiary attacks were incredibly destructive. Japan had started to westernize its architecture in the late 19th century, and at the same time, a lot of Japanese buildings that were still standing were historic wooden structures that were extremely flammable. During all of this, ordinary Japanese citizens faced huge hardships, including a critical food shortage that stemmed from disrupted supply chains, crop failures, and destruction of its merchant marine fleet. In the summer of 1945, much of the population on the Japanese home front was facing starvation. The Japanese government had to continually work to convince its civilian population that the war was still in the nation's best interests, in spite of all of this. On July 26, 10 days after the first successful test of a nuclear bomb, the United States issued the Potsdam Declaration, calling for Japan to surrender unconditionally or faced, quote, prompt and utter destruction. As we now know, this was a threat to use nuclear weapons, which at the time were still a military secret. And there are two main trains of thought about this point in the war. One is influenced by how dire conditions were in Japan and how destructive the firebombing campaign had been and how Japan was increasingly out of options. This train of thought is that Japan was headed towards surrender, although not necessarily an an unconditional one, and that conventional methods could still bring the war to an end. The other point of view was influenced by Western perceptions of Japanese culture and the tactics that had been used by the Japanese military during the war. For example, the Japanese military included kamikaze suicide bombers and an infantry that demonstrated an almost fanatical fight-to-the-death mentality. The list of war crimes committed by Japan during World War II is long and horrifying, and this just did not seem like a fighting force that would ever surrender, no matter how certain defeat seemed to be. So under this train of thought, continuing the war, especially if it involved an invasion of Japan itself, would cost far too many lives on both sides. So the Allies needed to take decisive, dramatic action to bring the war to a faster end, ultimately preventing that loss of life. And it was the latter point of view that led the United States to drop an atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima on August 6th, 1945. Which point of view was correct and whether the use of nuclear weapons was justified continues to be the subject of debate. The whole subject is contentious enough that in 1995, the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum canceled an exhibition on the Enola Gay, which was the plane that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. This cancellation came after five rounds of revisions between museum curators and veterans groups. The museum staff wanted to focus on the first use of nuclear weapons in warfare as a global turning point, one that connected to the nuclear arms race and the Cold War But veterans groups wanted to focus on sacrifice and on the atrocities that had been committed by the Japanese that led to the first use of the bomb. The peoples of the two respective countries involved also do not agree about whether the use of atomic weapons was justified. According to a 2015 report by the nonpartisan Pew Research Center, 56% of Americans believe the use of nuclear weapons was justified and 34% say it was not. Meanwhile, in Japan, just 14% say the use of nuclear weapons was justified. 79% say it was not. Regardless of all of that, Hiroshima specifically was chosen for maximum shock value. It was a city of more than 300,000 people, but it hadn't yet been targeted or damaged by the incendiary strikes that had stricken so many other major Japanese cities. The surrounding terrain was also hilly, which scientists believe would focus the blast and cause even more damage. In the end, the bombing of Hiroshima destroyed about 90% of the city and killed at least 80,000 people instantly, most of them civilians. Tens of thousands more died in the aftermath from radiation poisoning and radiation-induced diseases. 
The United States had expected that Japan would offer an immediate, unconditional surrender after the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, but that surrender did not come. And on August 8th, the Soviet Union also declared war on Japan. The Soviet Union deployed roughly a million troops into Manchuria, which is now part of China, on the 9th. And then also on the 9th, the United States dropped a second atomic bomb on the city of Nagasaki, instantly killing at least 40,000 people. Estimates of the final death tolls of the two atomic bombings are all over the place, in part because the bodies of many of the victims were destroyed, along with the buildings that held all the records of their existence. But the combined death toll of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was at least 200,000 people. Before this point, Japan had only discussed conditional surrender options, like trying to include guarantees that Japan wouldn't be subject to military occupation or that the imperial family and especially the emperor himself would be protected. But on August 10th, Japan finally started moving toward an unconditional surrender. It was formally announced on August 15th after a failed military coup meant to stop it from happening. Japan's formal surrender took place on September 2nd, 1945. This ended World War II, and it also led to the end of Japan's imperial occupation of multiple other areas, including Korea, Manchuria, and French Indochina. And of course, all of these places have their own complex histories after this point. Just over 10 years later, Sadako Sasaki died of radiation-induced leukemia as a result of having been near the Hiroshima bomb blast. And we are going to talk about her after a quick sponsor break. Sadako Sasaki was born on January 7th, 1943. Her mother, Fujiko, and her father, Shigeo, owned a barbershop. She also had an older brother named Masahiro. They lived in Hiroshima in a three-story wooden mortar home, 1.6 kilometers from the hypocenter of the atomic bomb blast. Sadako's father was drafted during the war, and her mother kept the business going while he was away. On the morning of August 6, 1945, Sadako was two and her brother was four. Fujiko Sasaki was at home with both of them, along with one of their grandmothers. When the atomic bomb exploded over Hiroshima at about 8.16 a.m., it blew the roof off the Sasaki family home, and most of their neighbors were killed. Fujiko Sasaki was not injured, but Masahiro had a head injury, and the force of the blast had thrown Sadako from where she was sitting into a box. For a moment, the family thought that she had been lost. Her grandmother's arm was injured as well. Fujiko bandaged everyone up, and as a fire spread throughout their neighborhood, took all of them toward the nearby river. They were rescued by a neighbor who loaded about 10 people into his boat and took them to the middle of the river. And they waited there until the flames subsided, unaware that they were being exposed to massive amounts of radiation. Their wait was horrifying. This boat wasn't big enough to hold so many people, and so they were afraid that it would sink or capsize. An oily black precipitation started to fall, and this black rain was a mix of radioactive fallout particles and particles from smoke that was blanketing the remains of the burning city. They could also hear people all along the banks of the river who were unable to escape the fire, who either burned to death or drowned trying to get far enough into the water. After the flames subsided and they were able to get back to shore, what they found was equally horrifying. In addition to the destroyed buildings and the bodies of victims, there were people who were still alive but suffering from extreme radiation exposure. We're not going to get into the details of what this was like because this information is both widely available and widely known, uh, but it was truly, truly gruesome. Twelve members of the Sasaki's extended family were killed that day, including Sadako's grandmother, who had turned back saying she needed to get something from the house before they got to the river. Sadako's surviving family left Hiroshima for about two years after the bombing, and then they returned to reopen their barber shop. They all recovered from their injuries, and for years it seemed as though Sadako had not been affected at all. Soon, she had a little sister, Mitsue, and a little brother, Eiji. They, and many of their neighbors, did not talk about the bomb, which, when it did come up, they more often called the pika, or picadon, which meant the flash, or the flash and boom, 
Culturally, the nuclear attack was viewed as embarrassing and shameful, especially because of the grisly and deadly nature of its effects on human health. Sadako grew into a girl who was well-liked at school. In the sixth grade, their teacher, Suyoshi Nomura, began training them in baton relay and other track and field events. And Sadako blossomed as an athlete. She wound up running anchor leg on the relay team. Because she'd been so close to the atomic blast, every two years, Sadako had a checkup at the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission. This was established by the United States government in 1946 to study the ongoing health effects of the bomb. Some of these effects were immediate, or they started shortly after the attack. This included keloid scarring, cataracts, stillbirths and miscarriages, and high infant mortality among women who were pregnant when the bomb struck. But other diseases, especially cancers, developed much later. In general, Japanese people didn't trust the ABCC. They associated it with the American military. And really, its purpose was to study the effects of the bomb, not to provide medical treatment or care to the people who were so affected. For about a decade, Sadako's checkups and blood work at the ABCC were all normal. In November of 1954, though, she caught a cold and noticed a swollen lymph node under her ear. She didn't have a fever, so the family wasn't particularly worried, even though survivors of the bomb dreaded the possibility of what was known as A-bomb disease. A-bomb disease was a catch-all term for a variety of cancers and conditions that were induced by radiation exposure during the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. People who were close to the blasts or who entered Hiroshima or Nagasaki soon enough afterward to be affected were called hibaksha, or bomb-affected people. Most of these were Japanese citizens, but there were also significant numbers of Koreans who had been forcibly relocated to Japan, essentially as slaves. Sadako continued to feel a little run down over the New Year holiday, and the swollen lymph node got worse. So she went to the doctor, who initially thought she had a virus. And when she still didn't improve after treatment, her parents took her to the ABCC, where she got extensive workups on January 28th and February 16th of 1955. On February 18th, her parents got the call. Sadako had A-bomb disease. Her specific condition was leukemia, which is a cancer of the parts of the body that make blood cells. Most types of leukemia cause the body to make too many white blood cells, which means the body produces fewer red blood cells and platelets. Since the red blood cells carry oxygen and platelets are involved in clotting, this imbalance in blood cells causes a range of other progressive health problems. The typical leukemia rate in Japan was two to three people out of every 100,000. But among Hiroshima survivors, it was closer to 30 out of 100,000. People who had entered Hiroshima in the days and weeks after the bombing had doubled or tripled risk for leukemia as well. After they learned that she was ill, Sadako's mother wanted her to have a traditional kimono. If Sadako had A-bomb disease and was going to have to be in the hospital, Fujiko wanted her to have the experience of having a beautiful kimono first. So after getting the call from the hospital... She and her husband went to pick up Sadako from school, and they took her to pick out fabric. She chose this cherry blossom pattern for her kimono. They told her it was a treat because she was going to need to be in the hospital, but they didn't tell her that she had A-bomb disease or that it wasn't curable. Sadako's mother and her aunts worked overnight to make this kimono so that she could have it and wear it before she was admitted. Sadako entered the Red Cross Hospital in Hiroshima on February 20th, 1955. That is just two days after her family was notified. On the way, she stopped at school to say goodbye to her classmates. There were 61 other students in her class. Even though so many people had been killed in the bombing, her school was still overcrowded because of the return of Japanese nationals from the empire's former territories after the war. Throughout the school year, her teacher had been encouraging the class to develop a culture of always looking after one another and taking those lessons to heart. After Sadako left, her classmates organized themselves into a rotation to visit her in the hospital in groups of two or three. Today, leukemia is far more treatable than it was in 1955. The five-year survival rate for children with acute lymphocytic leukemia today is about 85%. And for children with acute myelogenous leukemia, that's AML, it's about 60 to 70%. But in 1955, there was no treatment for the disease itself. 
The best the doctors could do was to give Sadako transfusions of healthy blood, along with a drug called methotrexate, which lowered the number of white blood cells, but didn't do anything to address the condition itself. This care was very expensive. There was no insurance or state-supported medicine and no central blood banking system. Families were responsible for finding blood donors themselves, and if they couldn't, for buying blood from the local blood bank. And after buying blood, they still had to pay for the transfusion itself. Sadako Sasaki's family put all of their money into her treatment, eventually even selling their home and their business in Hiroshima and moving into a barracks to try to save money. The Red Cross Hospital didn't have a separate pediatric ward. So Sadako's fellow patients included children and adults, and she became really beloved by both the staff and the other patients. She was always really optimistic. She very rarely complained about the pain that she was in or the other effects that leukemia was having on her body. A string of 1,000 origami cranes was delivered to Sadako in the hospital in July of 1955. And we're going to talk more about these cranes and exactly what they represented after we first have a sponsor break. The thousand origami cranes that Sadako Sasaki received in the hospital connect several pieces of Japanese history and culture together. So we're going to walk through all of them, starting with origami. Paper was first invented in China in about the year 105. Buddhist monks introduced it to Japan in the 6th century. And for centuries, paper was really expensive and quite difficult to obtain, so it was mainly used for religious purposes. The Edo period began in 1603, and by then, paper was far less expensive, and people were using it to make all kinds of art. We talk about the art of Japanese woodblock printmaking in our past podcast on Katsushika Hokusai. Printmaking allowed art- artists to mass produce and distribute paper copies of their artwork, and there are prints from this period in museums all over the world today. The first concrete evidence of paper folding in Japan comes from the Edo period as well. People were likely folding paper into shapes before this, especially in ceremonial and religious uses. One book written in 1764 documents ceremonial folds that samurai used on wrapping paper, which changed depending on what gifts were inside. The first written instructions for what we'd probably recognize as origami today came with Akisoto Rito's Sinbazuru Orikata, or Thousand Crane Folding, and this was first published in 1797. So orikata means folded shapes, and for a while it was almost used interchangeably with origami, which comes from ori meaning folding and kami meaning paper. More written instructions followed this 1797 publication. Although people today describe origami as using one flat sheet of paper with no cutting, these early Japanese instructions included various cuts and different paper shapes. As a side note, you'll see a lot of the same subjects in both woodblock prints and origami, including lots of flowers, birds, and other animals. And there are also lots of woodblock prints that depict origami models and people folding origami. Paper folding was becoming common in other parts of the world as well. Japan was not the only place where people were folding paper for some reason. Friedrich Froebel, known as the father of kindergarten, saw the use of folding as a teaching tool, particularly because of all of its connections to geometry and math. In the late 1800s, Froebel's origami-like folds and patterns were introduced into Japan and put to use in Japanese classrooms. So eventually, Japanese origami was being used as an education tool outside of Japan, and these German folds are being used in Japan. They all wound up influencing each other. For centuries, almost all origami followed the same traditional shapes and steps that had been documented in the 18th and 19th centuries. Akira Yoshizawa is credited with expanding the form in the 20th century, creating the symbols, arrows, and diagrams that are still used today, along with developing new folds and techniques. His work sparked a resurgence in origami all over the world starting in the 1950s. Today, in addition to the frogs, cranes, boxes, and other traditional models, artists use origami to make all kinds of work all along the spectrum from realistic to abstract. 
To move on to cranes, in Japanese culture, cranes, particularly red-crowned cranes, are significant. They're symbolic of happiness and long life, and according to legend, they live for a thousand years. Turtles are revered as well, and there's actually a saying that the crane lives for a thousand years while the turtle lives for 10,000 years. The number 1,000 itself is considered to be auspicious. So this is like layers of good fortune and positive things. A string of 1,000 origami cranes, or senbazuru, is said to bring luck or to grant a wish. So strings of 1,000 cranes have been traditional gifts to honor things like weddings and births. The string of a thousand cranes that Sadako Sasaki received in the hospital had been made by a high school class that was folding chains of paper cranes to give to patients with A-bomb disease. This part was not shared with Sadako since her family and her doctors were still trying to protect her from the knowledge that she was dying. By this point, Sadako had made friends with Kayo Okura, a 14-year-old with tuberculosis. The two of them started folding cranes together to pass the time, working with very small pieces of paper because it was easier to manage those smaller sizes while they were confined to bed. They used whatever paper they could find, from wrappers from other patients' gifts to discarded notepaper. One day as they were folding cranes, Sadako and Kayo talked about kind of a variant about uh, on that legend that we talked about before, which is that if you folded a thousand cranes, you would get well. So Sadako decided she was going to fold a thousand cranes in the hope that it would make her better. Some of the fictional depictions of Sadako Sasaki's life say that she died before finishing her thousand cranes. But according to the people who knew her, she finished her first thousand and moved on to a second set before she died. By the end, she was working with tiny, tiny pieces of paper that required a toothpick to help fold. And folding cranes was not the only way she was spending her time. Over the summer of 1955, Sadako wrote formal cards to everybody that had been in her sixth grade class. The class had formed a unity club at the end of the year because they were moving on to junior high school. They wouldn't necessarily be in the same class or even at the same school anymore. So the Unity Club kept visiting her after the school year was over. By August, about the time she finished her first thousand cranes, Sadako's condition was seriously declining. And that same month, Kayo's tuberculosis treatment was complete, and she was released from the hospital. Kayo promised to visit, but did not make it back to the hospital before Sadako died. Sadako Sasaki died on October 25th, 1955, at the age of 12. After her death, an autopsy revealed that she had thyroid cancer as well as leukemia. And later on, doctors would establish a link between A-bomb exposure and thyroid cancer as well. It was also after her death that doctors discovered that Sadako had been looking up her own blood test results at the nurse's station and keeping track of them for months on a scrap of paper hidden in her bed. So even though no one had told her what she had, it became clear that she had known for a really long time that she was dying. And to spare them from the pain, she hadn't let anyone else know that she knew. Sadako's classmates started to hear that she had died at school. And this mostly spread from student to student in the halls, since a lot of households in Hiroshima didn't have their own phone. It was then reported in the newspaper as well. A lot of her classmates went to the temple where her body was placed, and then they attended her funeral. And then at the funeral, Sadako's family gave the classmates who were there some of the cranes that she had folded. After Sadako's death, she and her cranes inspired a movement for peace. And we are going to talk about that, but that's going to happen in our next episode. Do you have listener mail? Sort of. Uh, I have a thing I wanted to generally address from a previous episode that we have done, which is our two-parter on the Wilmington coup. We've gotten a number of very angry letters about something that we said at the end of that episode. Uh, a lot of those angry letters are from people who told us they're not going to listen to the show anymore, so they're not going to hear this explanation The thing that people are really, I mean, there are several things that people are angry about, but one of the things we've heard about over and over is that we talked about a North Carolina voter ID law that had been struck down uh, by a panel of the Fourth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals who described it, they described this voter ID law as made to target African Americans with surgical precision. And we've just had a whole lot of people who have written to us and been like, but you have to have an ID to cash a check. Why don't you have to have an ID to vote? And I wanted to clarify, that was not the point. 
Uh, what this particular voter ID law did was that lawmakers gathered lots of information about how people were exercising their right to vote in North Carolina. So when were people voting? Were they going to early voting? Were they using absentee ballots? What kinds of ID were they using when they exercised their right to vote? And they specifically asked for that information to be broken down by race. And then when they wrote that new voter ID law, they got rid of the forms of ID and the early voting methods and lots of other tools for exercising your right to vote that were disproportionately used by Black residents of North Carolina. So we had a whole lot of people that were so angry saying, it's not racist to ask somebody for ID. That's not really what was happening here. They specifically were no longer allowing the forms of ID that that Black people were using more often than white people. And that is like a textbook definition of racism. (laughs) So the idea that this voter ID law was racist was not something that we made up out of thin air, and it was not something that we just sort of threw out there willy-nilly. It was extensively documented in the court uh, the court documents, the sorts of questions that had been asked in the framing of this law and the the very clear patterns in what, which pieces of ID were allowed, which voting schedules stayed in place, that kinds of thing. So uh, if any of the folks who are still really angry are still listening to the show... <laughs> That's where that came from. For the folks who maybe didn't send us angry letters, but were kind of wondering, huh, I wonder what was up with that law, because the stuff you missed in history class hosts don't usually use words lightly. Now you know. If you would like to write to us about this or any other podcast, we are at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com, and we're also all over social media at Missed in History, and that includes Facebook and uh, Twitter and Instagram and Pinterest. You can come to our website, which is mistinhistory.com, where you will find a searchable archive of all the episodes that we have ever done. You'll find show notes for all the episodes that Holly and I have done together. Uh, it has the, uh, the total list of sources for everything that we have talked about today. So you can do all that and a whole lot more at mistinhistory.com. And you can send, you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and wherever else you get podcasts. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit howstuffworks.com. 